Following the release of Rockstar Games' seminal Grand Theft Auto 3 in 2001, GTA clones of all kinds flooded the market, each one angling to capitalize on the sandbox game's popularity. That era of gaming lasted well into the 2010s, giving birth to Mafia, The Getaway, and Saints Row. Even brand licenses imitated GTA's winning formula. Scarface, The Godfather, and The Sopranos received video game adaptations in 2006 to varying degrees of success. With 2005's Mercenaries Playground of Destruction, developer Pandemic Studios delivered a GTA clone that bucked the common trend, sidestepping crime-ridden urban environments to instead use a politically unstable Korea as its setting. The end result offered a revolutionary experience whose main rival made it to market in the 2008 sequel, World in Flames. Rather than gangsters chasing the lap of luxury, mercenaries starred guns for hire caught in the middle of political upheaval. As opposed to crime bosses and kingpins, characters and mercenaries more often than not conferred with factions that represented the interests of entire countries. Critics and players considered this series a nice change of pace, nicely punctuated by Pandemic's unapologetically over-the-top gameplay. And though a third entry may have further expanded upon Pandemic's militaristic answer to the open-world chaos of Grand Theft Auto, mercenaries died with the unceremonious shuttering of the development studio. It was a death whose impact lingered as open-world games evolved beyond the parameters previously solidified by Rockstar and later adjusted by the likes of Pandemic Studios. This is the history of Mercenaries. Former Activision developers Andrew Goldman and Josh Resnick founded Pandemic Studios in 1998, their respective credits including Battlezone and MechWarrior 2. The California-based company started strong, courtesy of an equity investment from Activision. In addition, the publisher provided Pandemic with the tools necessary to build technology, QA, and customer support departments, all integral to the team's quick growth. Few were surprised when Pandemic's first two projects constituted Activision-owned sequels in the form of Battlezone 2 Combat Commander and Dark Reign 2. Goldman's and Resnick's group spread its wings upon joining forces with Electronic Arts for Major League Baseball game Triple Play 2002. Yet EA harbored bigger plans for Pandemic, pitching the studio on the idea of developing a follow-up to 1992 shoot-'em-up Desert Strike. In an interview for Patrick Hickey Jr.'s The Minds Behind the Shooter Games, Mercenaries lead programmer Ronald Pikett divulged that Pandemic's faithful replica of Desert Strike began development as a 3D update. This endeavor lasted briefly, though, as the two companies parted ways a year into production. But the essence of Desert Strike never left Pandemic. Rather, its remnants lay buried beneath Mercenaries Playground of Destruction, the team's second LucasArts published game after Star Wars, The Clone Wars. Using a modified version of the Zero engine that powered a majority of its past titles, Pandemic retooled ideas from the cancelled Strike sequel, then integrated them into the foundation of a new shooter IP. Pike had acknowledged the influence GTA 3 sandbox gameplay had on Mercenaries while speaking with Hickey, but added that much of the game design evolved organically at the studio. Explorable open areas, drivable vehicles, main missions, and side quests were concepts derived from Grand Theft Auto, of course. Mercenaries dug a bit deeper, however, providing players with a healthy supply of cause-and-effect-based gameplay choices. These decisions especially manifested in the players' dealings with the South Korean, Chinese, Allied Nations, and Russian Mafia factions, each bearing an agenda. After a North Korean coup overthrew an uncompromising regime, South Korea pushed for reunification with its northern neighbor. China, on the other hand, wanted to expand its border into Korean territory, creating an uncomfortable level of tension. Thus, if users worked in favor of one entity, they chanced facing hostility from the opposing side. Risky business considering the in-game economy and resources relied heavily on negotiations with the four groups. Pandemic incorporated another wrinkle into the choice system by assigning the three playable mercs a second language that corresponded with a faction. The African-American hero, Chris Jacobs, spoke Korean and constituted the strongest of the bunch. Chinese character Jennifer Mui was ex-MI6, making her the stealthier option. Lastly, players could select Matthias Nilsson, a roguish Swede well-versed in Russian. Chris garnered extra information from the South Koreans, 
Then, users who chose Jennifer learned more when conversing with Chinese representatives, and Matias proved most useful to those who wanted to appease the Russian mafia and its underground contacts. Thanks to the reputation system, embedded journalists covering the conflict took part as well, giving a condensed report of the player's behavior at the end of every mission. These evaluations determined how civilians and competing factions perceived the mercenaries' actions. But Pandemic didn't design these sequences to cast aspersions in one direction or another. On the contrary, Pike had insisted the team devise scenarios that avoided painting characters as heroes or villains, wanting choices to feel morally ambiguous. This emphasis on immersion also translated to general gameplay and special effects. Mercenaries' open-ended design presented a wealth of options, including dozens of realistic military weapons and a wide array of controllable ground vehicles and aircrafts. Developers additionally immersed players in the destructible environments by creating the mood of each area through carefully crafted backdrops and detailed special effects that many grew to associate with Pandemic's more bombastic adventures. It all informed a semblance of realism embedded within the experience, though not everyone appreciated the title's ripped-from-the-headlines style events. The catalyst for the overarching narrative revolved around rogue general Choi Song staging a coup against the North Korean government run by his father, Choi Kim. Players entered the picture as mercs for a private military company charged with toppling Song's newly installed dictatorship, a task complicated by his DECA-52 organization. Pandemic borrowed the concept from the DECA-52 hierarchy the United States established upon invading Iraq in 2003. The 52 cards in a deck represented an Iraqi on the most wanted list, with the highest ranking cards assigned to those at the top. Saddam Hussein was the ace of spades. Mercenaries designated Choi Song as the deck's most high-value target, giving way to a rather novel mission structure that further differentiated it from Grand Theft Auto. Players found themselves captivated by the engaging third-person adventure when it launched in 2005 for PS2 and Xbox. The free-roaming, gameplay variety and military trappings culminated in what IGN described as GTA and SOCOM's Cosmic Love Child. Stunning visuals and refined controls punctuated the praises leveled at the new property, whose first installment reportedly sold 1.4 million units. Amid the success came controversy, as South Korea banned mercenaries for depicting political and military conflicts considered too sensitive, given tensions between the two Koreas. Yet it lasted for a limited time, courtesy of South Korea lifting the ban and game censorship in general in 2007. The country's rating board specifically cited a desire to allow freedom of expression as reason for the change, and promised the contents of all previously forbidden titles would receive careful review. By the time this challenge resolved itself, Pandemic had already started a mercenary sequel that would catch the ire of yet another nation. Shortly after shipping Playground of Destruction in 2005, Pandemic entered production on Mercenaries 2 World in Flames. Development began in the midst of private equity firm Elevation Partners contributing $300 million to merge coder developer BioWare and Pandemic. Even as a collective, both entities maintained separate brand identities and continued working with external publishing partners. Despite the behind-the-scenes changes, then, Pandemic's expansion of the Mercenaries IP persisted unabated. According to producer Cameron Brown, post-mortem analyses on every facet of the original Mercenaries resulted in the team abandoning quite a few mechanics, including the DECA-52 card system. The studio similarly gutted its Zero Game engine, rewriting the technology from the ground up with PlayStations and Xboxes, then next-generation consoles in mind. Hardware limitations previously forced developers to scale down their ambitions with Playground of Destruction, Lead designer Scott Warner told Eurogamer the experience informed the creation of tools and technology for World in Flames. In turn, Pandemic rebuilt the engine to fully support open-world action games. Considering the studio's goal of giving users complete autonomy, much of Zero Engine's overhaul emphasized physics-based destruction capabilities. As a result, barring the terrain, players could destroy everything in Mercenaries 2, a feat senior producer Jonathan Zamkov called the most challenging. And if an asset couldn't properly succumb to demolition practices, it fell to the cutting room floor. 
Brown admitted development on next-gen wasn't necessarily a breeze, however, especially on the PS3 hardware that proved difficult to work with. Still, the processing power of the consoles allowed for consequential gameplay, more data processing, loss of dynamism, and weightier destructibility outcomes, all derived from a desire to bring the flair of 80s action films to interactive entertainment. Pandemic also tried limiting its reliance on the invisible walls and unspoken rules that stifled gameplay exploration in other open worlds. In this way, the studio carved its own lane in the genre, comfortably occupying a space somewhere between Grand Theft Auto and the vast array of military shooters while avoiding the tendency to lean too heavily in one direction or another. Differentiating Mercenaries 2 from its predecessor served as an additional hurdle, the first step taking root in a change of location. Speaking with Wired in 2007, producer and story editor Matt Colville recalled the team selecting Venezuela pretty early in production. Colville cited the South American country's vibrancy as one main draw because it contrasted with the monochromatic look of the original North Korean setting. And upon learning the United States procured more oil from Venezuela than in the Middle East, Pandemic positioned the highly valued resource at the center of the sequel's plot. Setting an open-world game in Venezuela invited more than a chance at exploring beautiful landscapes and crude oil disputes. Hugo Chavez's controversial presidency also ignited internal questions of whether Mercenaries 2 should venture into the country's politics. The 80s action movie bent convinced developers to avoid larger political concerns, believing such tales ran the risk of hitting too close to home, especially for a studio wary of making political statements in an over-the-top sandbox adventure. The concerted disinterest in local politics aside, Pandemic struggled to break the story that would ground World in Flames. Matt Coville said the problem predominantly rested in the discordance between gameplay and narrative, wherein creative proposals for the two parts occasionally diverged. In more than one instance, the team shelved intriguing narrative ideas since they didn't mesh well with the gameplay, and vice versa. A cathartic scene between the protagonist and villain, for example, got shoved aside because, while it made sense from a story perspective, the segment clashed with Mercenaries 2 as a game. With regards to gameplay, developers once pushed for a dam explosion to flood a city. Its lack of relevance to the plot culminated in the pitch's abandonment. The crew wrestled with ten story revisions as well, each of which came and went over the course of a year and a half. But the studio's apparently careful approach to Mercenaries 2 storytelling mattered little in the grand scheme of things, least of all from the perspective of the Venezuelan government. The sequel officially entered the public consciousness days ahead of E3 2006, followed by a formal reveal during the trade show in mid-May. Pandemic CEO Andrew Goldman touted the richly detailed, reactive, and living world. Cameron Brown insisted the Venezuelan locale would bring style and personality to the formerly gray and gritty mercenaries universe. Venezuelan lawmakers were unimpressed, fearing someone propositioned the American Pandemic Studios to convince U.S. citizens they should take action against their Latin American neighbors. And though Hugo Chavez made no appearance in-game, loyalists thought the project constituted a ploy to tarnish his image and that of Venezuela by depicting it as a war-torn region engulfed in chaos. One of the country's congressmen, Ismael Garcia, even likened Mercenaries 2 to a potential psychological terror campaign, propaganda the U.S. government employed so it can make things happen later. As an Elevation Partners board member, U2 frontman Bono found himself in the middle of the outcry after the Venezuelan Solidarity Network petitioned him to call for the game's cancellation. The issued letter expressed concerns that World in Flames might further escalate the antagonistic relationship between the U.S. and Venezuelan governments. Presumably, this intense unease stemmed from Pandemic's history with Full Spectrum Warrior, the series whose original entry began as an Army training program for the United States military. That Mercenaries 2's pre-release marketing regularly included imagery of Venezuela's destruction only amplified fears. Publicly, Pandemic didn't put much stock into the propaganda allegations, with Scott Warner telling Eurogamer that World in Flames' plausible scenarios meant it would inevitably garner criticism. Developers instead focused on selling potential customers on the sequel's new bells and whistles, heavily promoting the addition of online co-op along with the advent of swimming mechanics and boats as a new class of vehicle. The ability to hijack vehicles returned too, bolstered by a minigame and its scaled difficulty feature. Players should have experienced these advancements in Fall 2007, 
but the pursuit of a completely polished final product postponed Mercenaries 2 to early 2008. Studio co-founder Josh Resnick said the feature-complete title demanded bug fixes and physics-related refinements. And while the team toiled away on accomplishing said goals, publisher Electronic Arts acquired VG Holdings, the parent company of BioWare and Pandemic Studios. Industry pundits considered the $860 million acquisition shrewd given BioWare's work on Mass Effect and Pandemic's imminent release of Mercenaries 2. After all, on the heels of losing its spot to Activision as the top earner in game sales, EA needed the win. The fruits of Pandemic's labor on Mercenaries took longer to bear, however. In a January 2008 earnings report, EA CEO John Mercatella revealed the sequel's second delay, claiming it looked great, yet needed polish. Upon its release in August 2008 on PC, PS2, PS3, and Xbox 360, users discovered how much more fine-tuning the open-world adventure necessitated. Redundant gameplay and messy storytelling fell short of expectations, though engaging in Mercenaries' trademark mindless mayhem, either solo or with a co-partner, provided a fair amount of fun. Subject of the harshest criticism was the overwhelming number of glitches and lousy AI. Both proved immersion-breaking, acting as constant reminders that sequels sometimes failed at meeting the standards set by that which came before. The studio worked towards ameliorating the technical woes shortly after launch, deploying an update in September that addressed several bugs, in addition to resolution and joystick sensitivity issues. Pandemic also released the Total Payback update in October, inviting PS3 and 360 users to enjoy free bonuses like cheats and six playable characters. The Blow It Up Again DLC hit digital marketplaces months later, first landing on PS3 at no additional charge, then unceremoniously migrating to Xbox Live for $2. PC players never received these post-launch extras, and it wouldn't be the last time Mercenaries content went MIA. I'm Dr. Rubin. Are you available for a contract right now? Sure. Andrew Goldman claimed World in Flames could set the bar for explosive open-world action games in the next generation. Josh Resnick echoed this sentiment in an IGN interview approximately one year ahead of release. While these lofty promises went unmet, the third-person adventure still sold an impressive 1.9 million copies as of October 2008. Electronic Arts quickly greenlit a third installment, tentatively titled Mercenaries 3 No Limits, which John Riccatello teased during EA's November 2008 investor call. In this same briefing, the CEO voiced his hope that Mercenaries would eventually receive a tenth iteration. But as fate would have it, the series only lasted long enough to spawn two-thirds of a trilogy. Development on Mercenaries 3 ceased in November 2009 when EA shuttered Pandemic Studios and laid off some 200 employees. In a statement to CNET, an EA spokesperson called the move a consolidation, noting that core developers from Pandemic had merged with EA Los Angeles. EA Games label senior VP Nick Earle wrote in an internal memo that the publisher intended Pandemic's brand and intellectual properties to live on, as demonstrated by the announcement of Merck's Inc. not one week after the studio closure. The EA Los Angeles group bore the responsibility of building Merck's Inc., a multiplayer project with ground and vehicular combat that only saw the light of day in a single trailer. Because of its short-lived production phase, the public's sole reference of the vision for Mercenaries 3 exists in a milestone presentation, boasting early gameplay footage, animatics, and audio commentary. The prototype showed glimpses of the canceled game's first module set in 2017 Cuba, where the Mercenaries assignment had him escorting a journalist on behalf of the Russian Mafia. Thus, questions of what could have been persist unanswered. Mercenaries' brief history came to an abrupt halt amid corporate restructuring, wherein EA jettisoned about 17% of its workforce and trimmed down product lines to concentrate on the most profitable titles. Executives devised the cost-cutting plan following weak game sales throughout 2008 and 2009. As a result, multiple development teams were either closed or consolidated, all so Electronic Arts could, according to Nick Earle, take control of its destiny and run a stronger, more focused development operation. Of the studios lost and games axed in this restructuring, none landed as heavy a blow as the deaths of Pandemic and its inventive sandbox IP. And as open world adventures drift along a sea of stagnation, those who fondly remember the novelty of tearing apart the mercenaries' world can't help but wonder, what happened 
to all the good GTA clones. Thank you for watching. We'd like to take this time to thank, by name, the generous patrons who have pledged to our Hall of Fame reward tier, Fernando Lopez Ojeda, and those currently subscribed to our producer reward tier, Darirap Sigurdsson, GetWrecked.com, Lame Game Man, Milkshake, Schizo Lingbo. If you enjoy our content, please consider subscribing to our channel and backing us on Patreon.